Um, Pastor Agent has given me the task to share <laughs> some transformations in my life, stories that's been happening with me, and I can say I've got quite a few. But to start with where everything, who I was before and how I was born, um, you can ask and verify this with mum, with dad, and with Alicia. You may think that it's like, oh, David's energized coming on stage. David's, you know, oh, he's just so natural at blah, 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 and this and that. When I was baby David, fetus David, as Gen Zs like to call it, <laughs> was extremely, extremely different to the person standing here right now. Extremely different. And um, I encourage you that if you want to get the story from, a, from mom on who I was, because she understands more. Encourage it will be a hilarious story. But in my own words, David, fetus David or baby David only had two states of being. Can I keep saying that or should I stop saying that? Yes. Stop saying that. We'll go with baby David. <laughs> baby David only had two states of being. Extreme insecurity or extreme worry. I was called a, not a warrior. It was a warrior. You, you, you get them. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Um, or just utter recklessness, just a manic child running around the place, just didn't know how to switch between the two. And I think the best example of this, we often have a joke told in our family, and uh, Alicia and I like to say it a lot, it's that when I was born, I stole all the height. When Alicia was born, she stole all the confidence. <laughs> And for some reason, that always comes up when I'm at young adults and Alicia's speaking with joy and, you know, making jokes here and there. And I'm here just like, oh, I wish I could be like my little sister. <laughs> no, she's got, she's, she was born with amazing confidence. And this is so, so clear when it came to swimming carnivals. Do you guys, have, has anyone here participated in a swimming carnival if you're Australian? Yeah? Do you know the nervousness that comes up of starting on the block and racing? You do not want to experience it. It is terrifying. For me, at least. But for Alicia, <laughs> she saw it as a challenge. Mom used to say it like this. Um, Alicia, in the first swimming carnival, it's a very different experience between Alicia and I. Alicia uh, came up to the starting block and she, let's say, wasn't a very good swimmer. But the point is, she believed she was. She really believed she was. So here she was coming to the swimming carnival. And Alicia goes, Mom, I can do the 50 meter. And 50 meters for a little child like this small, especially, yeah, anyways, um, is a really long, long um, distance and she's going ahead and she's going mom I can do this I can do this mom literally had to grab a hand and pull her back going no you, you can't do it like, imagine a mom saying that you can't do something that's how much confidence she had in herself and the hindsight my first swimming carnival was me entering into the area the swimming pool at Unidera swimming pool if you know what it looks like that's what you can imagine and going, mom, I'm not doing this. And I'm in my trunks, you know. We've got the speedos during that time, which was very flattering. And I was saying, mom, I'm not doing this. Like, I'm not going to do this. And mom goes, no, you're going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I go up into the lines that you, like, race, start going for the 50 meters. And I'm telling to my friends, I'm not, I'm just here just for mom, just to get her satisfied. But I'm getting out of this line soon. Like, I'm not, I can't do this. Mom comes back again and goes, no, you're going to do it. <laughs> I go up into the first block. What happens is you get the, uh, so imagine the swimming pools are right here in my distance, in my point of view, and you've got the lines here. You've got another line of like each person going to dive off, right? I'm now on the third line right here. And in that very moment, I'm sitting down. I'm like, oh, no, it's going to happen. They're going to call me up. I can't back out down now. In the natural David response, I get up, I walk to the nearest bin, I open the bin, and I just start heaving into the just constant, you know, I didn't even eat breakfast this morning, so I don't know what was coming out. It was like bile, and it was just disgusting. The teacher had to bring me and go, 
bring David along and come to mom and go, he doesn't need to do it if he doesn't want to. He doesn't need to do it. He looks so scared, Lydia. Please don't let him do it. Mom goes, no, no, he's going to do it. <laughs> he goes to me and mom goes, you've got God inside of you. You need to be powerful. You need to be a warrior. And I'm like, okay, mom, I got this. To make things worse, I now am in the second line and I'm sitting down. Next thing is I'm looking at the people going off. After dry heaving, I completely, in a year six fashion, just pee my pants. And you just see this expanding yellow puddle go out. And my friends look over and go, yo, David, I didn't remember that place being wet. I'm like, no, no, rain. Rain was here before. That's what happened. <laughs> That's what happened. And um, later, as you know, I, I go onto the block and I swim. And it went all fine and dandy. I actually won and went to, <laughs> I, I won. And I'm like, mom, I did it. And she goes, I know. <laughs> But that was David. Every time there was a mate, there was some challenge happening, it was always me backing out and mum having to like have a stick and like, you know, push me to put me further. And each, each time there was a new transformation that came again and again until finally, you know, God's confidence is now being able to flow inside of me. It's not being relied on my mum anymore. It's now, hey God, what do you want? So that's just to give you exhibit A, David, and exhibit B, David, now. And the one thing I believe that was the key to transformation in my life to warrior David, to warrior David, if you guys get what I'm t saying, is um, one thing, and this is kind of the main theme of everything. I believe the key to transformation to life was my journey to loving God zealously. That was the one and only, only thing that I feel like was what made me transform again and again um, and what brought God brought me to. And I know if I was you and I was sitting on that and someone spoke up and said, you just need to love God more. The first thought in my head would be, oh, I already love God. I already go to church. I'm already going to church every single week. I'm giving 10% of my tithes. I even go to young adults and um, I even go to young adults. So I go to church two times a week. I am so, so Christian. Um, <laughs> And to speak for the Asians people in here. Yala, I of course la, I give so much. I give my children to the church. I put them in Sunday school. Uncle Roger even cooked fried rice and give it to the friends. Oh, so good la, I'm so Christian la. That's um, trying to imitate the uncles that I lived up with. Thank you. <laughs> Outstanding work. Was that a good Asian accent? Oh, please don't. Is there a camera there? I hope it's not recording. <laughs> the worst part of it is that my best friend is watching right now and I know he's cringing. He's just watching and he's like, gosh, David. Hi, Tom. Good to see you. Um, yeah, so loving God. But yet God says that the greatest commandment is, so if we got to the first Bible verse, and this is the foundation Bible verse, Matthew 22, 36 to 40. Um, I'm not sure if it's up, but if you have your Bible verses on your phones, Bible on your phones, turn to there. Very quickly, it's um, the Pharisees talking to the Pharisees talking to Jesus, and Jesus. There we go. Perfect. Thank you so much, teacher. Which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, "Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment." Um, can we skip a few? We'll say the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. But the next verse is also a thing I want to clarify. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. When I first read this verse, I read it like this. Love the Lord with all your God. Hey, love, <laughs> love the Lord with all your God. Perfect. Love the Lord with and it was just static every time I read that. Never read the second bit. But as a group, can we read this together, love the Lord? So let's read love the Lord together and loudly and passionately. You guys ready? Love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Now I'm summarizing that into love 
the Lord your God zealously, passionately, with every fiber of your being, love him. And all the prophets and the law hang on these two commandments. What that's saying there is that that whole book with Moses and the Ten Commandments and all the stories and the prophets talking about the great forecoming of Jesus was just to give you a insight on how to love God better. How amazing is that? So that's what I truly believe. I'm realizing that every story of transformation where I've been pushed out of my boundaries was only that I needed to love God better in a better way. And so I've clarified it in these three points here, that zealously loving God transforms the way we walk, zealously loving God transforms the way we see, and zealously loving God transforms the way we love others, the second commandment. Now, looks like a lot of people here did swimming carnivals. Can I put a hands up on who has been to a Christian school? Oh, Christian school, not so many. Oh, that's, that's a fair few. You guys know about assemblies, right? Correct me if I'm wrong, but in assemblies, do you also do worship? Or if you go to a Catholic school, there's like an altar call. Would you agree that that's the most awkward part of the whole assembly when you're sitting down and you're like, okay, I'm listening for such a long time. And they go, all right, everyone, stand up. We're going to worship the Lord today. And you just know it's just going to be the people on the stage singing and us going, just blank faces on a hundred school children. Like, take a snapshot of that. I think it'd be phenomenal. <laughs> um, it was very much like that in my school life also. Blank stairs, worship the Lord, blank stairs, everyone. And if there was ever that one new kid who came in and was very Christian, because they were homeschooled and they came in, you know, <laughs> not realizing <laughs> that that's not how schools operate, they start singing. And everyone would stare at them. And you could feel a thousand stares just pointing at you. Um, you were just beaten into just being silent during worship. It was phenomenal during school. But as a young kid, I saw these teachers who weren't also worshiping. They were just, the kids were just imitating what the teachers were doing. They just weren't singing. And then you're also imitating your friends. You're just seeing that, oh, hey, they say they love God and they say they love their families and all that stuff. I know they're kids, but, you know, they say it. Yet, you just don't see it during worship at all. In my church life, however, as you guys know, my mom and dad are two very, very powerful people, as per the swimming carnival story. Um, but also how they were raised was in a very spiritual atmosphere. Let me wrap my head around my thoughts for one second. Sorry. Um, yeah, so I would have these two different lives. School life where they say that they love God and it's just no action. And when I come to church, here we are worshiping and I'm seeing the love of God passionately, passionately talking. And I was seeing that I realized very early at a young age, and I'm sure you realize this too, there are two types of people in this world, two Christians specifically. Those who love God but don't show their passion and those who love God truly, zealously, that they cannot stop talking about God because he's included in every conversation, just nonstop. You can't, you can't not talk about God with them. You talk to them. I'll use mom an example. Sorry, mom, for putting you in the spot. It's going to happen a lot more times. Um, you talk with God and you talk with God. You talk with mom. <laughs> you talk with mom. <laughs> Close, I know. You talk with mom and you'd say to her like, oh, hey, how was your day? And she's like, man, I had such a good prayer time this morning. It was so good. And I went to the groceries. I went to buy ice cream, but there was no ice cream there. And I knew God was telling me that I need to stop eating ice cream. <laughs> it's just constantly, it's like, God's involved in every thought, in every decision. And these were the people who basically were in my church life. And I was like, oh, there's people who have these life in them. And there's these people who say and what they do is differently. There's one more person who actually pastored my mom and dad, and we call her Pastor Elizabeth. She's now passed away, but she is, was a phenomenal, phenomenal woman of God. I heard stories from my mom and dad about her, and it felt like she was real to me even though I never met her. But she would, 
she, she pastored a young church, a student church. And uh, you know students, right? They don't sleep at night. And they also don't have a lot of financial, they have a lot of financial problems because they're just getting by in the world. So this woman, being in a very old age whilst pastoring these students, she would sleep every single night, very late, calling, trying to help um, these students out in their personal life. And I even heard stories where, like, I love Pastor Elizabeth because when I asked for her, um, I asked for her, I was struggling with my debt, and this is what I'm going through in my life. She comes in and she buys the uni tuition fees for them. And she still lived in a small house. She wasn't living luxuriously. And I'm growing up and I'm realizing, oh, there's only two ways to live, really. There's only two ways to live. I decided I want to live with the people who have given life to the people around them. And the people who cannot stop talking about God, that every thought, every fiber of their being points towards him. So the next assembly comes along. I'm not a new kid. They know I don't sing in assembly. And one time, there was, a, there was a, an event happened, but I won't go into that. But I come to assembly and... I'm singing out loud and everyone is staring and I'm just realizing, no, devils. <laughs> I will worship my Lord. <laughs> Mind you, I'm in year six, so because that's how I had to process things. And every week it would happen, it would happen. Guess what happens? Other people start following you. Other people start realizing, oh my gosh, maybe he doesn't care about what I think. Maybe there's something in him that he thinks is a higher, higher calling. Amazing. It's amazing. Just loving God is zealously is the point that when you're talking with your family, that when you're talking to your kids, when you're talking to your workmates, you cannot stop talking about God. It's inspiring. It's, uh, what do you call it? When It's contagious. It's contagious. And so Ephesians 5, 2, this is what I love. Walk in love as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. That's exactly what we're talking about, that when you walk, it's like perfume. You can just smell this person has God in you, you know? That sounds really bad, you know, for, in other contexts, but it's true. You can smell that this person has a greater love. And that's, that's, that's how I want to live. So it's now time for us to be those giants, now more than ever. It's so amazing to see we've got a big Sunday school. That was the age when I started realizing there were two different types of people. And so every church, every young adult, every interaction we have with these and with our friends, imagine they're already realizing this church people is so different to my school people. These people have life in them. It's amazing. So that's transforming the way we walk. Zealously loving God transforms the way we see. I think this is my, this is probably the hardest, not the hardest story, but it's a good one. I love sports. Alicia and I love, love sports. As I, after I've started changing the way I walk, I started to be able to play basketball, volleyball, tennis. I was doing something every single day. God decides, or maybe God decides. One time I was um, jumping on a trampoline with my friends and suddenly I heard this massive crack as I extended my knee and I fell down and I couldn't straighten my leg. It didn't hurt, it just was a random crack. So what I did in classic Asian fashion, um, I hit it like a TV. Oh, wow, it works again. So I started walking back home, straight to home. And there were moments during this time where I would, my knee would lock and wouldn't lock. And I'm just like, oh, it's fine. I just need it. Hit it twice, ready to go. Until one morning, it didn't go back to normal no matter how I hit it. So I went to mom, and she didn't know that I had this random crack. And I go to mom, and she's standing here. And I'm walking like, hey, mom. So good morning. I don't think I can go to school today. I think it's time to go to the physiotherapist. My knee can't extend because I feel like there's a bone locked inside my kneecap. Lo and behold, that's exactly the story. When I was playing too much sports, I overworked myself until my knee cracked and a piece floated inside my knee and started locking in and out and I was just forcing it to unlock all the time. Now, for me, I was like, it's no pain, it's no biggie. I went to the physio. He goes, 
Oh, he refers me, can't tell you what the problem is. We're going to get you to the best knee specialist in Wollongong. Dad and I look at each other and go, oh, right, okay. We go to the best knee specialist in Wollongong. We take so long just sitting. And finally he calls us in and he goes to me, he's stressed. Like he's sweating. And he goes, I'm so sorry to tell you this. Just be warned, you know, just prepare yourself. Just all that stuff. And all I remember in that story was like, you might not be able to play basketball or sports ever again. And I'm like, but I have a competition next week. <laughs> How am I gonna play? And in classic drama fashion, I go, <laughs> I run out the door and just start weeping and weeping and weeping. I've completely lost, like, God, you've given me so many abilities to play sports and now you've just taken it away from me. Why? Why did you do that? He goes, I refer, I'll refer you to you to the best knee surgeon in Sydney and we'll work it out from there. Went, best to the knee surge, went to the best knee surgeon in Sydney and he said, look, David, it's not a good look. You've got the biggest piece break in your knee that I've ever seen and operated on anyone before. There is only a 10% to 30% chance that you will, this surgery will be successful. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is insane. It hurts. And he said, even if it's successful, you might be screaming in pain every single day, even with the most intense painkillers, and it's going to take 10 years to heal. I'm 16 during the time. Is that right, Mom? I was 16 during the time. I'm in year 10. You know, that's the peak physical state. Gone. <laughs> Just gone. And so in my head, I'm like, fair enough. Guess we got to do and keep moving on. Dad was so helpful during this time. He gave me a verse that I think it was saying, um, for God does not give a spirit of fear, but a spirit of courage and love. So that was the verse that I held on to continuously. I held on and I was looking at that verse from the surgery, going onto the bed, reciting it as they put me to sleep to my surgery, thinking about it as I woke up from my surgery. God did not give me the spirit of fear, but gave me the spirit of love and courage. And during that time, there was so many things and I think it was just this one thing that kept me. I was thinking and reading back into the woman who was bleeding and touched Jesus' feet and he was instantly healed. Jesus never said anything to that person, never touched that person. It was a woman who touched Jesus. And Jesus says something really interesting. By faith, you are healed. That became my obsession. <laughs> I repeated it day and night on the hospital bed going, Father, I believe. I believe it's already healed. I believe I won't have any pain. Father, I believe that you've already healed me. And I've got like this cast. It's really hard to say that you're healed when there's a, like blood coming out of the bandage and you're just sitting on the bed going, I believe I'm healed. It just doesn't work and looks very strange. Um, but that was my repeated words. My perspective started to change the more I said it. The more I said it, my perspective started to change. I started to believe the words that came out of my, my mouth. And it was phenomenal because the doctor came in and goes, we'll give you two Panadols. I'm like, I don't feel any pain. And he goes like, you will in the next 24 hours. 24 hours pass. Gives me another four sets of Panadols. No, it was just two, sorry. Two sets of Panadols. I'm like, I still don't have any pain. Oh. Oh, that's weird. You will in the next 48 hours. 48 hours passes. It's like, all right, you're permissed to go out now. And the person goes, I will prescribe you with the highest, most intense painkillers we have to dull the pain. And I said to him, going like, I don't think I'm going to get it. Do I have to still get the painkillers if um, I don't feel any pain? And she goes, no, but get it because you're going to cry when you go home. I'm like, in my head, I'm like, no, I will not. So I walk courageously with my crutches, going by, not grabbing the painkillers, no pain. Never did I have pain, even though the doctor said 100% you will have pain. 10 years did not become 10 years. It got healed in three. And the doctor was saying, what have you been doing? Why are you healing so quickly? And I'm like, <laughs> and he goes, you haven't been playing basketball, have you? I'm like, no. I was playing basketball every single day on my crutches. I was shooting the hoop with the crutch and like putting it in. Alicia saw this in first 10. It was great. 
And that's my, that's when I realized, oh, faith is where it's at. When you realize that the love of God for you is so strong, he doesn't want you to suffer, that every suffering and every trial is just to lead you to greater faith, now every problem and challenge you see from now on doesn't come from a state of God, why have you punished me? It starts becoming, I can't wait to see what faith can do in this challenge. It's amazing. It's really amazing. And not to say that I don't have challenges. Right now I have faith in one thing. My present challenge is I'm very disorganized, <laughs> extremely, can I say. Um, and I'm not good with words writing down emails. And I'm, I've been praying for this for five years. I'm having faith every single day. I'm saying, God, you will give me the skills so that I can excel in my workplace. You're going to give me the skills so that I can excel in my life. That's the current faith challenge I'm going through at the moment. And that's what I think it meant when God says all the prophets and the law hung on these two commandments. So when I think of that, I think of King David, who's the king, the royal, who's supposed to act like Queen Elizabeth, you think she's calm, all that stuff, right? King David loves God so much, he goes to the streets and starts dancing naked. And then his wife goes, oh, I'm humiliated. What am I going to do? But it was a righteous thing that King David loved God so much that his situation, the humiliation he has received, he did not care. He just loved God so much that he couldn't express it in any other way. It's the same way when Paul was in Philippians, in prison and in shackles, chained, and he starts the letter saying, I am filled with joy and I pray joyfully every single day because of the love of God. Even though I'm bound by these shackles, it's a testimony to what Jesus is going to do next. Amazing. When we start seeing and walking by faith and realizing that by faith, because God loves us so much, we have faith, our troubles aren't so, it's, it's just different. It's different. You're no longer tethered to, man, worship was good because the band was good. Man, worship was good because the singer was good. You start worshiping because you love God so much that no matter what, you will scream. Even though you don't feel anything, you know that he's real and you just keep shouting out loud, raising your hands as if he's standing right next to you in glory. When you pray, you don't pray based on you, how your friends like, oh, Father, we believe, da, da, da. You pray loudly as if he's a passionate friend who's coming and close to you and you're so excited to tell about the things that, you have in your life updating him. It's amazing. Everything changes because God becomes real. Because come, God becomes real. So, zealously loving God transforms the way we see. No longer does the earthly things matter. Now, it's all about how close am I with God. Last point. Zealously loving God transforms the way we love. I think this has been the most recent story after changing the way I walk, to changing the way I see, changing the way I love has been the hardest journey. Um, and it all comes, starts from, I led youth uh, straight out of high school and I was filled with passion, you know. I was on fire with God. You, you know that he healed me and I had so many things in my life. And as things kept going on, youth kept going on, and I kept doing things on by my own works. I didn't have any people at the time because we only had a group of five and seven. I, I started, something strange started happening. I went from a mindset to I have so much love to give that I want to overflow it to other people to start realizing, hey, I'm really tired to go to youth. I'm really tired at the moment. And that slowly turned into a, hey, I actually hate leading youth. I didn't fail to express this to my sister or my mother. <laughs> I've started gaining this weird thing where I came to youth and I finished it and I for some reason had this hate inside me. Like, I don't want to do this. I was never asked to do this. Why did you put me in this situation? During the time it was weird because worship was still on fire. The teaching was still going well. People were learning. People were receiving God. But every week, it became tiresome and I never wanted to do it anymore. 
this became a three-year search. I woke up one morning and I said to mom, um, she saw me in my eyes. Things literally started turning gray in my eyes. I went to mom and she goes, and she, I look tired. And she goes, Cole, what happened? And I go, mom, I can't do this anymore. I'm out of love. That was the best words that could come out of my mouth. I wasn't depressed or anything. I'm out of love. So that became a three-year search where I turned to psychology. And psychology says, rest. Take me time. And it's good. It's good stuff. We should rest and we should take me time. But I became obsessed over rest and me time to be the sole solution for my stress. But I noticed that every time I rested, I would get out of my room and I would feel even more tired. And I hated leading the youth more. And I became even more stressful. And I didn't know what was happening, so I just bared with it for another three years. Everything changed when I went to this, when I met this one man who, he's 40 years old and I meet him and I thought he was 20 because of the way he carried himself. He's like a child. He looked like he never saw a problem in his life. You know, he was talking like, oh man, I love Jesus. It's so good. Oh, this is great and all that stuff. And I knew instantly that's who I want to be when I'm 40 years old. I want to feel like I had no pain, no stress that brought me back, but I'm just so filled by the love of God that this was what was exuberating out of him. So I started following him. Every, every week I would try to catch up with him. That slowly turned to two weeks. That slowly turned to a month, all because of one thing. Every time I presented my problems, which was stress and kind of not enjoying leading youth, he only said two things. Oh, you know what you need to do more? Read your Bible. Oh, you know what you need to do, do more? Love God more. I'm like, thanks. Next time I come in. Oh, I've got these another set of problems. You're not reading your Bible enough. You're not loving God enough. I come again and he says the same thing. You're not reading your Bible enough. You're not loving God enough. I'm like, when is this guy going to give something new? I'm trying to pour out my heart and he's giving me the same solution. There's no way that there's only one solution to everything. So I decided maybe he's got a point. Maybe I should read my Bible. Maybe I should love him more. The first thing I've opened was Hebrews. And you know what it says there? You will find your rest in me. In God, you will find your rest. Something clicked. Oh, I'm not supposed to be sitting down playing Zelda Breath of Wild in my bedroom to rest. I'm not supposed to be watching Netflix to rest. I realize my rest should be coming from the time I'm spending with him. That's just philosophical. I tried it out. I tried it out. I came to God and I kneeled on the ground and I got, God, give me energy. Father, I keep praying, not hearing anything. I keep praying. And suddenly I hear a whisper and he says, I've given it. Life. And I'm not joking. I'm not a spiritual person. I usually don't like to. I'm not a spiritual person. I'm a very spiritual person. I'm not going to lie. Um, um, during that time, energy, like literally filled my cup. And I understood what it meant that my cup was overflowing again. In that one moment, I got up out of my bed. I'm like, I'm ready to lead young adults. Again, passion started to flow through. Again, God started speaking to me more. And I realized that God corrected me. And he said, during that whole time you were leading, you were pointing them to me, but you were never walking with me. You kept talking about how good I was but you never asked me what you wanted me to say to them. Everything changed on how I approach young adults now. Young adults now, it's just phenomenal. No matter how little worship we have, no matter how little the people, just tapping into his presence has become so easy because it's not about his presence or what I'm feeling. It starts becoming, God, you, you love me so much and I know I love you. And you just keep, keep pouring it out of you. It's amazing. It changes everything. It changes everything. So if you've ever felt dry out of love, which I know we have, because burnout was one of the biggest problems during lockdown. There was a study by Keith Farmer, and I can't remember the numbers for the life of me, but you should know that the moral of the story is the pastors and the church leaders who prayed were the ones who were able to prevent burnout the most. And it's just great. 
Just the personal relationship of love is what gives you the energy. So, um, oh, this is the last point here, uh, which is zealously, still on the point of loving God. Zealously loving God transforms the way you love. As you encounter God's love, His love is the same for all of us. Do we believe that? But we're also very unique, right? God then will show his love towards what is, resonates with you because he wants to show you that he loves you. And what I love about that is that that makes that our love to other people becomes different too. Imagine if we have a whole church loving God in every single aspect, the way that God loves us differently. A new person comes in and where they're surrounded by that, by each and every segment of love, it is phenomenal for that person. So I just want to say that when we point our hearts to God and He gives us the love back, that's going to just expand out to how we love other people too. Yeah. So those are, I guess, the four transformational stories. In the end, what I just want to be is imagine we had a church full of King Davids, a church full of Pauls, a church full of Abrahams where they did not stand by the context of the earthly realm but they stood by how close was God to them during that time. Um, Yeah, so that's my transformation. (laughs) Amen.